Would you say that you've been epic curious lately? No? <laughs> I love building enterprise gear. I'm building a VMware cluster. One of the machines that I'm using for the Gigabyte cluster, the Gigabyte VMware cluster, is the G221Z30. This is the second Gigabyte node in this cluster. But I wanna show you the chassis, and I wanna show you the possibilities, more than just a cluster. But first, we need to go to the data center, or server closet, or whatever you wanna call it. We need to go get it, and then I gotta bring it up here. Now it's a bit loud down here because this is where you put a server, but this is it. This is two U, two rack units of glory. I've actually got two gigabyte systems here. This is the system that I reviewed before with all NVMe storage. Check out that video and all that. But not super convenient to look at this system in this config. I need to take it back to the workbench. But I can show you a really cool feature. Now you might be asking, how are we gonna get back to the workbench? Am I just gonna turn it off? What's going on? Well, from the IPMI, I can actually control that from my phone. So with the IPMI interface, I can actually turn on this button and to be sure that I've got the right server, this light will glow blue. And so it's like, all right, cool, I've got the right server. Now instead of just hitting the power button and doing a hard shutdown, I can actually pull up the console on my phone and remote shut down VMware so it'll be a clean shutdown, which is a nice feature. This is the Gigabyte G221Z30. So what about in terms of connectivity? Well, you've got the two by 16 slots that also have by eight slots just below them if you're gonna run one slot cards. You've got the 16 DIMMs of connectivity on the motherboard. You've also got onboard M.2 on the motherboard, onboard USB 3. This chassis does not have the front USB 3 connections depending on what chassis configuration you get. You may have USB 3 on the front, you may not. Just depends on which version of the chassis you get. We've got all of our EPS 12 volt connections here though. The EPS 12 volt connections are really cool because uh, most of these higher end server graphics cards don't actually use the PCI Express style 12 volt connectors, they use the motherboard style connectors. Gigabyte's really doing some interesting stuff in server chassis and maybe I think so because I'm used to working with Dell Enterprise and HP Enterprise and we'll talk more about that in a second. But I really like this chassis, and I really like what Gigabyte Engineering is doing in terms of flexibility. And this is not the first chassis that I've taken a look at, it's highly modular. The first thing you'll notice if you look up this model on the internet is that the front is configured a little differently on mine than it is on the stock configuration for this chassis. That's because it's modular. You can do NVMe, you can do SAS, you can do SATA. The default lowest end configuration of this will do SATA on its backplane. You get 16 uh, SATA drive slots, which is sort of what you see there in the, in the picture online. But the way that I've got it configured here, I can do four NVMe and 16 SAS drives and four SATA drives, which actually works out pretty well because you can mix different tiers of flash storage speed and get whatever you want as far as software defined storage. Now, because this is an AMD Epic chassis, meaning I'm running a 7551P here, uh, it's an incredible value. It's an incredible value proposition because you get 128 PCI Express lanes, there's 32 cores, 64 threads, even though it is a single socket system. It's an absolutely monstrous system. And of course, I've got my Tesla V100 in this. I've actually got two Tesla V100s. It's a little bit of a long story. One of them is on loan, one of them is uh, sort of permanently added to the level one collection of insanely way expensive hardware. 32 gigabytes of HBM. If you wanted to build your own home Stadia server, this is probably what you would do on the NVIDIA solution. I'm working on the AMD solution. It's not quite there yet. The AMD solution is a little bit more standardized with the SRIOV. But for machine learning, like a starter system in a lab, that's an easy to use solution. You could put two V100s in here, no problem. As it's configured, I've got dual 1000 watt power supplies, which is more than enough for anything that I might run. Shipping config is dual 1200 watt power supplies. You've got a lot of options. One of the big differentiators for this case is that it has ducted airflow over the card. So if you have a card like a Tesla V100, it doesn't actually have any cooling fans. It relies on the chassis and forced air to do the cooling. Not every rack mount case has this kind of a duct that's adjustable to actually force air over the card. The effect though is that the fans in this chassis can run at a much lower RPM. 
if you're doing a high-end home lab build, this chassis or chassis that has a ducted config like this and you're gonna use enterprise cards would be a great choice because you can run the fans at a lower RPM and get the same airflow. Now the, T the V100, strictly speaking, is a 275 watt card, so it's not producing an insane amount of heat. You need, you need forced air over it, obviously. But uh, the other chassis that I've been running that does not, it's got a ton of forced air, but it doesn't have any ducted air over the card. It's basically fine, it runs a little cooler, it is quite a bit louder, but this config will let you run in a much quieter configuration. The other secret to Epic is using eight channels of memory per CPU. Now this chassis will support two terabytes, yeah, two terabytes of memory in this configuration, which is just utterly nuts. But the full eight slots get, means that all four of our CPU dies on the 7551 are in their optimal dual channel memory configuration. Works great for VMware, works great for bare metal Linux, which is what all of our benchmarks are done on. Uh, it works great for Windows, anything that you might throw at it. If you are gonna run Windows, I would suggest that you reconfigure the UEFI to run in unified memory access. So if you're not in the know, there's you can run, if your memory configuration is balanced, you can run NUMA or UMA. And NUMA means that you get four nodes, each with two sticks of memory, and if you have an unbalanced memory configuration, meaning that something like you got one stick of node per dim, or you've got you know two nodes that have two sticks and two nodes that don't have any sticks, if you don't have eight channels fully populated, in other words, you're gonna be running non-uniform memory access because some of the cores get to some of the memory differently. You can opt to run non-uniform memory access even when the memory is relatively uniform if you have an application that is latency sensitive. But in my own testing, I've been hard pressed to find anything that is super latency sensitive outside of like the realm of day trading and Grand Theft Auto 5 and the P version of the Epic CPUs is a cost down version so if you look it up and you look at the cost of a 7601 or a 7551 you might say dang those those CPUs they're a good deal but you know they're still kind of pricey but if you look at the P variant you can save quite a bit of money so right now this system is configured with a 7551, but I actually did a head-to-head -head with this system with a 7351. That is a 16 core uh, processor from AMD that just came out in November. It's an epic processor, but it's, you know, it's a higher clock speed, 16 core version. And I put that head-to-head -head against a Xeon Silver uh, 4114 and an HP ML350 Gen 10. Now I've got some bad news. I lost the footage from that. The memory card died. I didn't have a chance to move it off of the memory card. So I'll give you the summary, which is um, the HP, like the HP Enterprise server from HP included a Smart Array 420 and a CPU, and it was like $3,200, $3,300 from CDW. Uh, added 64, took it from, I think it was 32 gigs to 64 gigs, and that took it up to like $3,800. This chassis in the bare configuration online, uh, it's about $2,300. This is on loan from Gigabyte, so didn't do anything with the chassis, but I bought all the other stuff, so. This configuration with the 7351 absolutely destroyed the HP Enterprise server and came in about $400 cheaper. Like, there's just no other way to put it. Like, in just in terms of performance. But the HP Enterprise solution also nickel and dimes you. So, like, there's a lot of cool stuff here. Like, we saw in the server closet with the shutdown, the IPMI. The IPMI is full featured. Virtual console, graphics mode, uh, media pass through. Gigabyte is not nickel and diming you with the interface. You can even do the orchestration. So, like, with the, the, the Gigabyte software, which I have not tested. Uh, but with the Gigabyte software, if you have a bunch of these, you can orchestrate them just like you can with the HP Enterprise uh, LU, like the the uh, the ILO um, Supplemental Updates Manager SUM. So things get sort of weird in HP Enterprise. If you're not using SUM with your HP Enterprise gear, you are really missing out because it'll basically do everything for you. And let me tell you, it's a dumpster fire in terms of firmware versions and drivers and things like that. So like that HP Enterprise server, oh, I really wish I had the video. This is an HP two terabyte SSD. This is SAS6. This is an older drive. It was manufactured in, this one was manufactured in 31st October 14, but these were manufactured up through 2015 and 2016. So not that long ago. God, some of these are still under warranty from HP. Uh, tried to migrate them over from the old chassis to the new chassis. Guess what's incompatible with the Smart Array 420i? That kind of stuff, like how does that even get past QA? Gigabyte 
doesn't have this problem. <laughs> Even the ARM system, it's like, I wanna plug this into ARM. It's like, yeah, we don't care, it sounds good. The IPMI, with the Gigabyte IPMI, you get the media pass through and you get the, uh, you know, vir the virtual media, the USB media, you get the console. With the HP, when I went to the IPMI and I was doing my operating system install, it let me do the operating system install and then it closed out. I was like, that's weird. And I clicked on it again and the HP IPMI said, oh, sorry, you gotta get the fancier license key for the IPMI because you're in the operating system now. We don't, we charge extra for that. HP Enterprise cost $300. eBay cost $37. Really, really? Gigabyte is not pulling any of that shenanigans. Now, the default configuration, I will say, does not support SAS disks without an add-in controller. That's the only thing that I could find in the, in the specs where they maybe need like a star or a footnote or something. So my SAS drives here, SAS 6, uh, two terabyte flash drives. I added in an LSI controller and passed it through that way. The default backplane for drives on this one is also simplified versus the other one. The other backplane that we looked at could do NVMe in all slots, you could do SATA in all slots, you could do SAS in all slots. In this configuration, it's just the SATA style connector. So there's not a port multiplier here or any kind of like redundant connection to drives like a, like a mesh, like a fabric that you normally would want with some of your high availability servers. Really even two socket servers are kind of going away. And so what people are doing, what businesses are doing instead of dealing with the more expensive servers is just making it so when a server dies for whatever reason, it just, the software just fails over. And that is a perfectly logical place to go with the software. And so you see this cost down in, uh, in server SKUs like this. Now, when, when I did my Dell review, my Dell PowerEdge review, because I got a Dell PowerEdge that was just so unbelievably terrible. Um, and it turns out that was probably bad hardware. This HP might possibly be bad hardware because it, it literally spits out the, the SAS disks. It's like, nope, can't do it. Uh, after just a random amount of time. It's like, oh, the disk is bad, but then you run disk diagnostics and it's actually fine. Cabling issue, sled issue, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> the reality is that um, we don't like, we don't really need servers to be that reliable. With the Dell, it was missing like the fan thing in the middle to make it cool properly. So if you add any hardware at all, it's gonna overheat. HP has basically done the same. The fan bar thing is extra. It's not extra here, it's built in. Like you can't order it without it. And so that's why I say, I think that Gigabyte is doing some really interesting things in terms of engineering. Uh, this is configured so that you could fit two Tesla V100s in here. So it's gonna be a little problematic to get to all of your PCI Express lanes because there's not physically room, but I can see another version of this case where I've got my V100 on one side and then I've got, you know, like four or five half height, half length slots on this side. You know, as you can see, because I'm not running my second V100 here in this node, I'm running it in the other node. There is a version of this case that's all half height, half length cards in the back here. And so if you get the half height, half length versions of the Teslas and just run a bunch more Teslas, that'll work perfectly fine for a VDI experience. Yeah, 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 enough job boning. Tell me the nitty gritty. For a single socket server, AMD Epic 7551 or 7371 or 7351, this is uh, basically an unbeatable deal. Unlike HP Enterprise, they don't nickel and dime you. Gigabyte does not nickel and dime you with things like the IPMI upgrade cost and, and you know unlocking hardware that's already there or anything like that. It's Threadripper. It's got 128 PCI Express lanes. You can go nuts with NVMe, depending on you know your chassis and some other options. You could go nuts with connectivity. I'm going nuts with Tesla V100s building a VMware cluster. Yes, we are VMware certified. Yes, we can do two terabytes of memory. Yes, we can do super high speed PCI Express peripherals. It's a single socket, but really, you don't really need more than a single socket at the, at the medium end. I mean, you look at the cost of the Xeon, you know, um, Silver 4114, and it's roughly the same as the 7351. And the cost of this chassis is comparable to that ML350 Gen 10 from HP, except the software bundle here with the IPMI and the features that the hardware offers is insanely way better. Dual power supplies versus a single power supply. This backplane is the lower end backplane, but this is still a better backplane setup that you get with HP. With HP, you just get the eight drives and that's it. Everything else is an add-in 
and it's again nickel and diming you. It's like you don't you get the cage, but then the cage doesn't come with cables, and then you have to get the cables, and then if you don't use the HP Enterprise cables, oh my warranty, oh this is a much more sane approach. This backplane here is designed for a whole bunch of SATA drives for storage and then NVMe for cache. Uh, but I do have it configured with SAS drives connected through my SAS controller. So I've added in a SAS controller to get the SAS connectivity. But the connections on AMD Epic will handle all of these SATA drives or PCI Express if you go with the upgraded configuration, the upgraded modular backplane for drives that we saw in the other config. This backplane does not have a port multiplier or the redundant connections to drives. That's completely okay because this is again a cost down chassis. If you do the apples to apples comparison with the ML350 Gen 10, 64 gigs, 64 gigs, uh, this actually comes out about $400 cheaper, but by the time you add in things like even just upgrading the IPMI, that already makes it $700 cheaper instead of $400 cheaper if you go with the retail prices. The connectivity here is better, the cabling here is better. The fans, there's only two fans in that HP. That is, that is some serious BS. You gotta get the add-in fan card, just like the Dell that we reviewed. So I'm really happy with where Gigabyte is going. The market is ripe for a disruptor to come in, especially with the prices that we're seeing from AMD on their Epic CPUs. Uh, and it's gonna be a really exciting time to build servers because I'm very tired of $5,000 servers that only have eight cores or 10 cores. That is, that is some serious BS. This, this is gonna disrupt all that. The Tesla V100 here is three times more expensive than the chassis. I mean, that's pretty nuts, really. Uh, maybe it says something about the value proposition of the Tesla. But hey, if I'm building my own Stadia system for some other videos that we're working on, what are you gonna do? I mean, I'm working on getting a Radeon Instinct card, but for now it's gonna have to be the, v the dual V100 VMware cluster. I'm, I'm Wendell, I'm rambling way too much, it's time to go. If you uh, wanna talk shop about servers disruption and, and that time you bought something from, it's like nobody ever got fired for buying you know, a big name, uh, situation that went terribly, terribly wrong, come to the level one forums, let's talk shop. I'm Wendell, this is level one, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.